This is Tristan Mills' exploration of the instrumental space of technology and planning. Episode 2, Section 1, Conversations with Abiwe. So just to jump straight in, um, I want to ask you a little bit about what you've been up to. Last time we spoke, there was uh, some stuff with Soweto or Alexandria that might have been on the horizon. So yeah, what have you been up to? What have I been up to? <laughs> Listen, man, I'm in between buildings. <laughs> um, well, let me start off to your first question. Uh, I read the question yeah, that you sent to me, yeah. just inspiration. To this interview as well, just thinking back, I mean, um, I liked your first question around how did I start from essentially doing research on open spaces and so on to now focusing what I'm more interested in now more than anything is um, the GIS stuff. So understanding how to use GIS tools to better understand the city, but also to better communicate, right? Um, so I think for me, that was just a nice throwback to say, yeah. it's been a, I mean, I started um, with a, a keen interest in the township, right? So understanding the township and how um, some parts of it are incredibly inefficient, right? Just spaceship. And in my master's in urban design, I got interested. I was well. I was. I was always interested in what we call the buffer zones, right? Oh, so yeah, it was yeah. a, almost like a, a very still um, contrasting and striking um, component of the of many townships in the in our cities, um, yeah. where you have these long buffer zones that either wetlands or um, they are even edges like um, um, railway trains. For yeah, example, like, like things in the That completely apartment. divide different yeah. parts. Yes. Yeah. Not only divide the, the townships to, let's say, industrial areas or suburbs, but also divide different sections of different communities within the, um, within the, within the township area itself. Oh. Right. So I was, um, yeah, so... So I've been living like my whole, I, like I grew up in the township. I grew up in Tanzania, which is like the second largest township in, in South Africa. Um, and then I moved um, to Johannesburg. I lived with my aunt um, in Pimbo, right? So it's Soweto, so like one of the biggest townships, in, again, in the country, right? So moving between that and coming from a planning spatial um, background, um, it, those are the things that kind of irritated me, um, transversing between the two um, areas, one Bromfontein, for example, to 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 home, which was painful at the time. Yeah. And when I was back at home in East London, um, Dazan and transversing between school, um, the city, and um, the township, right? So, like these vast amount of land that completely um, uh, separated parts right and I was for me the most irritating thing was how separate how hard it is to get from your friend's house yeah. to your house right how, how hard it is to visit each other so it's one of the things that I thought would be interesting to just delve into and um, I mean I, I didn't really have a particular direction and where I wanted to take my urban design and what I was interested in particular because there's so many things to look at and there's so many issues obviously but the idea around open spaces and the public realm and um, and this particular space that was in, well, that is interesting to me and still is interesting. Um, so I looked at one of the things that I try to look at is um, parks. I mean, this was also related to my finding. My yeah. finding, I was finding my NRF at the time that they were looking at open space. Oh, okay. So I was like, oh, why not do buffer zones, right? So these green open spaces, almost like buffer zones. So that's how I that's how I got into uh, that. Yeah, but I think if I if I can link if I can link it to what I'm doing right now, my whole thing about I mean, I think our all all our things in the both environments. If you're interested in the city, you're interested in urban living and um, spaces, um, urban design in particular. You're interested in how experientially you can shape the city to better. Um, to make just to make to make people's lives um, easier from moving one from one space to another, right? Yeah. So my whole thing was about how do we make either how do we make our people um, just their lives 
kids, yeah, especially people who are already struggling, um, facing a lot of frustration, not just economically, but also, um, uh, what is it? What can I call it? It's, all these socioeconomic issues that we are facing, how can just space make that um, life experience a bit better, right? So if you're talking about the majority of the, the population, which is youth, but also black youth, and the racial um, frustration that happens in the city, that um, space has to, um, has a lot of um, ways in which it, it almost exacerbates that frustration. So my whole thing was about, okay, how do we make at least one thing better so that these people can move a bit better, so they can experience a step bit better. Yeah. So efficiency uh, is quite important to me, um, not only spatially, but also in terms of tools. Yeah, I can right. see how you jumped into the, the RGIS then. I think what you're saying about the, the, the belts being used to, or these buffer zones being used to separate communities within um, individual spaces was quite interesting because I always thought of it as like this apartheid era thing to separate, um, uh, you know, like African people from white people. Um, mm. But it never really occurred yeah. to me that it was actually separating people within their own communities as well. Um, yeah. So, yeah, I mean, going through your... Um, your, your masters and your your honors stuff to do a little bit of uh, research before this this interview and um, what has struck me is how you um y your drawing style was very 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 much like lentilies where it's the the hand drawn um artistic style um and I, I was so confused i was like how do, how do you go from this to like the rgis <laughs> which is this, this clean like very clinical uh, look quite often um but yeah, I, I think it makes sense um, to use it, especially for things like that, because the the analysis that you can do just happens so much faster. Um, yeah. yeah. I mean, I think yeah. I mean, that's a quite an interesting observation as well, because one would think that because I'm interested, like I'm, I mean, I'm very, um, what I I prefer to use digital and when I'm even when I'm designing or I'm doing analysis, I prefer to use like software. Music because it's just an extension or make things faster and much more efficient. But I think when you are thinking through, um, I mean, at least um, where I was at the time um, between masters and where I am now and how technology has evolved between just these past few years, well, let's say five, six years, I think there's so much stuff that has been done, especially when it comes to GIS um, and um, digital drawings. Um, that enables for almost like conceptual thinking uh, that it, that um, has changed. So I found it at the time very difficult to almost think through the city conceptually, but also in terms of design um, through those softwares. So I knew, I know I, I, I did a lot of Photoshop things, but what was irritating about the Photoshop and the Adobe software is that there's no real data. As soon as I finish doing that map and how much, no matter how beautiful I make it look, like, you know, yeah. how cynic I make it look and how emotional I make it look to depict what I'm trying to say, it could never really be useful after that, right? Or without me there. Yeah, so it's like right? this one image place, of what happened. Right? Yeah. It's static. Yeah. So um, for me, just trying to almost cross those lines, I had to always move back and forth between pen and um and digital and i think that's what i struggled with and i think for me and how gi has evolved now is that it's exciting because there's so many things that the way that these softwares are now starting to start talk to each other which i think um, um your topic um around ai and gi is working together the the things that deep learning has been enabled um that softwares start to speak to each other you know yeah so and that's some expert that's why it gets me excited about gis and um yeah and the city it's i mean gis to me is extremely exciting i think the space coming up where you're talking about like that static image that you um like produce with coral draw or mm -hmm. photoshop or any of those things um what i like about the the arcgis like now um is arcgis pro and arcgis urban it's it's kind of um turning into more of like a web-based um, like application that's live. Like with um, RGS Urban, there's, there's a way to create a digital twin city that can be updated on the daily. So anyone, anywhere who's doing a project 
will do it live on that digital twin. So you'll be able to see who's planning to do what where in the city. Um, you'll be able to zoom in and do like th uh, 3D walks throughout the, the spaces and you have 3D mass buildings. Um, I think maintaining a, a, um, yeah, a twin like that would be so beneficial just to save so much time with planning. Because I think the amount of times that I've had to draw like a base map of Brahm or mm. <laughs> something like that is hours of work. Um, that's yeah that very much just disappears with the project right um like it doesn't stick around at all um, yeah man and i think i think that's what makes me excited about um what is it is able to do now is there is so much time um that you are that now i'm trying to push um well just in terms of creating tools right to push so that one we can almost fast track the mundane things so the the unthinking work so that we can get to the creativity or the the problem solving part of um, a part of seat making yeah. all right so i feel like there's so many i mean there i mean there's so much so much so much we uh, we should be going like there's so much things that that um uh, there's so much that still needs to be done in terms of gis and how ai can enable gis but also this so much now that we're able to do so that it almost takes away the really unnecessary work um like drawing a base map right no one should be drawing another base map right now right yeah uh, if the software can allow to us to do that um unless it, there's a particular creative endeavor that we are trying to do there um but yeah man it's for me that's what's important is to how do we how do we get to the thinking and the creative part of this, yeah. um, the problem solving part of it, um, faster, you know? <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. I think that, that does bring up another bit of an ethical question though. So for example, today when you're looking for this, um, the contact data for project you're working on now, um, it reminded me of um, a thing that I've been learning to um, do recently with some coding. Uh, it's called internet scraping. Um, I don't know yeah. if you've heard of it before. Um, oh. Yeah, so basically it's um, a couple lines of code and you can search for kind of any data on like a website or for example Twitter you can search for over a certain like time period everyone who's posted a hashtag or yeah, um, yeah you can pull all of that data off and put it into a, a spreadsheet. Um, you can kind of pick any data, you can take their names, uh, if they posted photos you can take the geolocation of the photos to huh. make maps. Um, it's it's quite I think ethically questionable because yeah you can you can get contact information off of Twitter, um, but I think leveraging that kind of data could be quite beneficial to planning as well. So where do you think the line lies with that? Like where 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 do we gather too much data from the people we're trying to plan for? You know, um, yeah. Uh, I mean. Here's my, I mean, my take on it is that there's definitely a lot of um, governance, so data governance that needs to, the city still needs to think about, um, decision makers need to think about um, in terms of rights and data rights and privacy rights, um, privacy rights and protecting people from um, very malicious ways of using data, right? Um, which, I mean, there's, there's been all, all kinds of debates around that, right? So, but for me, that should not be the reason to almost still put a, put a hole on um, what all the good that we can, um, the, the data can do, right? So just because there's potential risk associating with data, um, there's also so much work and so much um, efficiency that, that can come from the data that is generated almost lately, right? Yeah. So one needs to find almost like the balance um, where people who um, people who need to protect people's rights and people's information are doing it as fast as um, the data is being produced, right? Um, so, but it, this doesn't mean that now there should be like a security wall, complete security wall until people figure out what this thing is, right? Yeah. Um, it's unfortunate that along the way, um, people are going to misuse information, people are going to use it 
for their own capitalist, <laughs> almost beneficial ways. Very much. Manip- manip- manipulate consumers, manipulate people, manipulate governments, um, yeah. even manipulate systems, right? Um, however, um, we need we need um, almost the liberty to access this kind of information because access and not necessarily controlling access to a point where it gets into the way of um, all the positive positive that comes with it. Right? Yeah. So I'm hoping that the people who are um, are thinking around governance in terms of how we govern, how do we protect um, individual um, privacy um, and uh, privacy around the, um, the data that's being generated um, almost daily can it almost can happen simultaneously, you know. Yeah, and um, what, uh, what you were saying there about the capitalism as well is, while I was researching this topic a bit, I came across um, so Spotify right now with um, their predictive models. They can kind of guess your ethnicity um, with, based on the music you listen to, but they can also see if you've recently gone through a breakup. Um, I mean, they're, they're, they've got a partnership with uh, Facebook where they sell that data right? yeah. to Facebook. So then Facebook targets you wow. with comfort foods and things like that. And yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But I think that kind of level of, I mean, think how fast the census would be if you could, um, there's a German company that sells Vodacom's like location tracking data on the, from the phones. Um, you could do a census within a, like a couple of hours. Um, a full yeah. census of everyone, where they've been, where they're staying, what ethnicity they are. It's, um, so I think if you use it for a positive thing, uh, like instead of sending out thousands of people and waiting, what it's over a decade now for our census. Um, yeah, then, and I mean, I yeah. think for me, that's why that's why people like town planners, urban designers, um, people who are within the the thinking of the human being and the public good, right? Yeah. need to get at the forefront of these things, right? So because, I mean, it's it's so crazy because AI has been here and it's just we are, as the built environment, are catching on now only because now it can make our drawing faster <laughs> or it can help me write an essay faster. <laughs> you know, now people are starting to wake up. But AI has been almost around us um, because I don't, it's not like this machine thing that, um completely out of you know it's, i think it's like how you're saying it's like related to programming it's related to algorithm right yeah, yeah. <laughs> so people have been writing algorithms the thing that helps like facebook um spotty things like spotify things like there's so much google has been doing it for the longest time and it's it's so much around us you know right now that it, you don't you it's very difficult to really notice because it has become so much of uh, their everyday lives but now when it, we think about the things that we do as town planners and urban designers and architects and and, 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 um, and how we can use um, and be at the forefront of that kind of technology is really crucial because there's so much one can do with just exactly the sense of data. There's no reason why we're getting sense of data only now, right? When there's so much rapid change that's happening every day, right? Um, and people are, there's technology now to access it. Yeah. So, yeah. I think you can definitely get trapped in thinking like this stuff is um like normal or um whatever, but it's 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 an amazing technology. I mean, Yahoo came out with their um like search engine back in the 1990s. Um but just that algorithm would have been so useful for planners. Um just being able to predict um well, you obviously don't want to go too far with prediction, but population growth is um very useful. I think something that's uh, coming out right now with uh, NVIDIA's, they're doing a digital twin of the Earth, so they're calling it Earth 2. But it's a weather prediction system that doesn't just predict the weather within like the next 10 days or whatever, but they're doing decades like forward thinking predictions. Um, so they, they can predict forest fires, um, the climate change. It's massive amounts of computing power, but it's not unrealistic. And I think predicting, for example, like how cities or people move in cities, would be much more simple than predicting the entire weather system of the planet. Um, so why aren't we right. using yeah. that yet? Like, um, well, yeah, why are we still like trying to dig out old plans or, yeah, struggle with drawing base maps? But we can literally yeah. right now with data available predict where the city's going to grow. Um, 
it's we, we're definitely behind yeah. <laughs> yeah and i think for me that's where i am right now it's just a pity that i think I'm, i feel like i need to there's so many things i need to go back to school for <laughs> but it, I, I feel like i don't as well at the same time because things like coding right um, and um, writing just code and how Python has been made so accessible now to people who, um, to, to, to even planners can try um, art and sing. Like, there's so much um, resources as well to enable for us to teach these things. But the only issue, I think, for me, what's laying us behind is that no one is thinking about these problems the way that we do, right? Yeah. Um, that's why you don't find kind of problem solving algorithms that are already there for us to enable us to solve um, problems better right yeah and for me where I'm at with this whole coding thing um, is how is this um, it's how we communicate I think for me um, and that's where I'm coming in with well well that's where how my interest right now is to developing tools to enable um, communication so things like surveys right so how do we make um collect the data that's already been collected every time we go out and collect the service but how do we um, visualize that data in meaningful ways that enables us to communicate better right yeah. uh, because so much of our time is really spent on communicating ideas and communicating the status quo um where we are doing this in ways that are not in mostly inaccessible, right? Through the PDF document, through a PowerPoint presentation, right? Yeah. Uh, when how people access information and how people are engaging with data every day has gone way, way beyond those mediums, right? So what are other mediums that we can start to build in, um, for town planners to better communicate for to decision makers or to, to different um, um, sectors of the public, right? Um, yeah. Stakeholders, right? So, and for me, like just, just in that small part, where it's about communicate, how do we communicate the issues better, and how do we communicate how we could make these things better, right? And make that accessible. Yeah. Um, that accessibility yeah. is a big thing. It's uh, I saw a project happening in uh, Spain. I think they did it in uh, like Scandinavia as well, where they they set up um almost like a touch screen um kiosks in the public space and the basically thing it was a is a map of the street um as a 3d interactive thing and it was asking where would you like to see like trash cans or um, benches or trees or anything like that um so literally all they had to do is go and put up this um touch screen and then anyone walking past could give their input and their feedback and that was just yeah th that data could be captured and used for the the design intervention that was coming um I think being able to interact with the public's definitely not a strong suit of planning. Um, and I think definitely something that um, technology can help with because instead of having to go to like local council meetings, which you know you have to have the, the time to go, you have to have the means to get there, um, and then you have to wait around in a room with uh, like a couple dozen or a couple hundred people and like, try and get your, your little say in. Um, and then you also have to wonder if that data is even being used because um, it's a big problem okay. with mm -hmm. planners just, all right, cool, uh, public said this, we did public participation, mm -hmm. let's, let's move on. Um, so I think accessibility, and we all have phones. It's very, yeah, yeah I mean, think of the way you can um, interact on like just Instagram with um, like local clubs or anything like that. Like why are like drinking places more accessible than, you know, government interventions? It's <laughs> yeah, right. like, yeah, it's it's quite a strange phenomenon. And um, so you've been working with uh, the ArcGIS survey at one, two, three. Um, yeah, yeah. You, you also mentioned that you were building um portals for businesses. Um, what was that? Yeah, I mean it's a small project that I'm piloting um for myself. It's around how do I create dash. Well, it's really around. The fact that there's so much data that's collected, right, in the city yeah. um, by different line. municipalities, but also by different, um, let's say, offices, right? So, for example, in places like places like Alexandra, right, every other two years they collect surveys. So, uh, what is what they call social surveys, right? Around the and line, all that data eventually, um, right. at the end. 
um, it sits in reports, right? Yeah. And everyone is frustrated at the end of the process that there's so much data that was collected, um, but oh no one really can understand it. The designers can't understand it because it's in these tables and graphs. Um, the right, planners are finding it difficult to speak to designers about the data and choose what they found. Where were we? <laughs> we were talking about the, the, the business portals that you're setting up and the, the surveys. Oh, that, yeah. yeah. Yeah, it's really a pilot project that I'm trying out for myself. Um, I've been, well, I think what inspired it is the a project that we, I had recently finished with um, ASM, with Monica, around creating digital cities or digital twins. Right, there was this whole investigation into digital twins, um, a concept that, well, an idea that the city trans the speed transmission yeah. Department in the city, COJ, had initiated, right? So then we had been appointed to be the urban designer project managers for that. So it was basically collecting all the data and putting it into one data base, almost like a one pot. Yeah. Um, so we then had, we had, there was an extensive exercise, right, with different, different other specialists, right, that were part of the team. And one of the, one of the thing was to explore different ways, to not only collect data, but also to um, think about how it's going to be visualized, right? Um, and engaging with different stakeholders and how are they access data and what tools they are using to collect information, but also to visualize. So the idea was to create a digital twin. Um, and then in, in essence, that would almost bring the city in a digital format to life right yeah uh but it was going to be an incremental stage and we had we were involved in the collecting of the data into one data day so my after the project ended uh, my interest was okay with all now the stuff that we have what are the ways that one could use it to be useful for different tools for different um um for different stakeholders right yeah. um it was particularly for the planning department. Then we started to just brainstorm things. But our our mandate was not really about helping them figure out how that tool is going to look like, the portal was going to look like. So that yeah, so, so basically it was the long term of it was to build this portal to house the digital twin of the city of Johannesburg and using it a, using a pilot area to explore that. Right. Okay. Well, yeah, that must so, be the the Quantic portal being so frustrating. Must be extra frustrating for you, then, right? <laughs> yes. you're actively yes. figuring out how to make it, you know, portals yes. actually usable. <laughs> I mean, yeah, I think for me, it's my relationship with technology as well. It's just like if it's not making your life easier, then it becomes useless. I don't care how clever it is. Um, if one can't use it, if it crashes on your phone, if I can't open it with a very basic technology and i have to have all these five different gadgets to do this to engage with data then it becomes useless yeah right so how yeah. can we make it usable accessible as for me in the number one thing and that's how this whole my whole thing around how do i take the data that's already been collected by um different businesses around the city and pilot that Right, so we're working, I'm working with another project now. In Alex, there was a social survey, so putting that together into a portal. And then looking at their workflow, right? So that next time that they collect the data, um, it becomes easier to incorporate. So you build an archive, right? Yeah. Um, from there. So, yeah, so yeah, so I'm basically just testing that out. Um, and this comes in different, different formats. It can be dashboards, it can be portals, it can be, yeah. Yeah, all of the apps, interface, yeah. Apps, right? Um, and the idea is to look at different user groups as well. Say, okay, you're talking one and through a dashboard, you're talking to, um, to say, decision makers, so politicians or city managers. Or what tool you are talking to stakeholders, which is the residents, the, um, property owners, um, youth, and and and. Yeah. So how can you create 
tools for those different user groups. Yeah, I think it's also, um, I mean, you, you can, at, at face value, you can be like, oh, right, no, like, you just don't want it to, to like, crash on you or whatever. But I think this, the, like, having bad portals actually has a far-reaching consequences. Like, um, I, I heard a story from one of our lecturers where um, there, there was this woman who, um, she, she ended up getting, a, like, a BRT card because um, she was like, all right, she's only got a certain amount of money per month that she can spend on transport. And it'll be quite nice if she could just put that on, you know, a transport card. So then she can't spend that money unless it's for transport. Um, so yeah, she, she put 2,000 Rand-ish onto the card and BRT went on strike. And there was no portal to get the money out of the card. There was no way to um, contact anyone um, to yeah yeah help her out. So what ended up happening is she didn't have money to tra transport herself to and from work and ended up losing her job because like the, the, the simple interaction of the person and the technology that we we're trying to um, like implement in the city just was garbage it wasn't working um, so, so yeah so for me so for me then yeah, that becomes important because I feel like the interface is very important as much as the back end is very important as so it's now coding um, but you're also looking at um, UX design, right? So that's, yeah. Um, yeah, so it's between UX design, right? So how do you do that? So as much as important as the data that was collected, right? Yeah, no, exactly. Because, yeah, user friendliness is very important. <laughs> I think you can also do Facebook's drop on uh, like user base just because of their, their interface being crappy. Has yeah, it has monetary consequences for a lot of businesses as well. Mm. Imagine you know. she lost her job, man. No, she did. Yeah, it's you know, she didn't have the money, and there was no way on the interface to get in contact with anyone or yeah, you know, uh, withdraw the money. Um, so yeah, it's just just bad UX and bad even back end. There, it's just uh, obviously not coming together. Um. Yeah, I mean, so talking oh. about uh, things that expedite the process to get back onto a positive note, um, the oh. the Photoshop thing you sent me, um, oh my god, that looks amazing! Right, <laughs> like the, the integration with AI, like the, the being able to just select what you don't want in your um, yeah your image and put what you want in there. It's gonna <laughs> speed up because okay, I am very bad at drawing. Um, I just, it's just, I don't have the skill, <laughs> so I think it's gonna help me visualize my like you know interventions and things a lot more, yeah, easier for me. Um, yeah. Yeah, I mean, it, it really questions um, the draftsmanship and the creative aspect that comes with design or illustrating a a concept, right? Yeah. Uh, so I feel like I'm not too sure yet where we are with this, right? Or how I really feel about this. But I think that you don't have to be able to draw to be able to be a designer. Yeah. Right? So there are certain concepts that you can have that you might not be able to illustrate. So therefore, you might not really be able to do any sort of or being part of the conversation of the problem solving, right? because you just are too scared to draw, or you don't know how to illustrate what's in your head, yeah. right? And that's where the draftsmanship becomes like now, um, I'm one of the people that's been like all nighters at the lab trying to illustrate or think about how I can better communicate a particular thing in my in my concept or walking around the clock um, at the office because I'm trying to illustrate something um, so that people can understand or the client can understand. Right. So for me, um, technology should be an extension of our intelligence, right? And I think GIS AI has so much to to play and um, to make our life much more efficient, um, our workflows much more efficient. Yeah. I'm really excited about it. I'm really, really excited. I mean, have you heard about things? There's also Mid Journey, right? Yes. That's... And architects are, I think, and I think for me, people are talking about plagiarism and all these other issues. Um, and yes, they can be issues, but I think it's really giving a superpower to people who are already putting in the time, right? Yeah. Because what happens, especially with the AI stuff, is that you, yes, you are. It helps you with the 
almost like the first stages of the work to thinking about concepts, um, initial ideas around concepts. Um, it almost helps you get through that um, or get through the concepts much more quicker, especially if you, the inputter has all this reference to bring into the program, right? So for example, like things like, I think it's Dale E, no? Yeah. I think they pronounce it Dale E. Things like Dale E and, 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 and these programs are almost, you have to, for, for, for you to be able to do something that's creative, you almost have to put in inputs or prompts that are highly descriptive, right? Yeah. And you almost drawing references from your own knowledge, right? In terms of artists that you're drawing in, the history that you know of different styles, um, of different places that you've been. Um, so you're drawing from your own knowledge and you're essentially inputting this and something comes up, right? Yeah. And I think for me, I think there's so much there. It then enables, it almost gives you a superpower, especially when you know your you, you know your urban history, you know your president studies, you know you there's so much archive that you are drawing from already from um, the stuff that you've read or you've learned or places you've been to do been in, right? Um, because the more generic stuff is really gonna go out the window, right? Because it will be a particular style because you don't have that reference um, from yourself to draw from. Yeah. And it's just, I think it's an, of, I, I think it could be an extension of, you know. No, I, I, I definitely <laughs> of, agree, yeah. Uh, yeah. It's, it, it becomes a force multiplier, right? Because, I mean, you can use mid-journey or the dolly and you just, you put in a, a sentence mm -hmm. prompt and you get you get a really pretty picture, but it's, it, it really is just like that. But when you start, like, you know, you get deep into the paragraphs and you, you start calling on um, like philosophers and artists and all of those things, then that's when, when it really becomes mm -hmm. like a, a useful tool. Um, yeah, something that, yeah, creates stuff that actually meaningful to projects and it's also great in the um just the conceptual phase i think uh, nvidia's got a it's called the nvidia canvas where it's it, right now it's just to draw like land pretty landscapes but on the one side you've got these tools that are very basic it's like a little line for a river a little little um, color for a, a rock or something like that but then you take those tools and you're drawing on this canvas and it's interpreting what you want. So you draw a river and then it draws like a photorealistic river into the photo. Um, mm. So that also becomes like this force multiplier of, um, all right, you're not the best at drawing or perspective or, you know, gradients and things like that. Um, then let the computer do the heavy lifting for you. But your creativity mm. and your um, your purpose of when you're putting like, you know, the, the, the brush to the canvas, um, that remains. Um, so it's just increasing the, the speed um but also the accessibility yeah. of all of these things um mm. yeah, I, yeah. I mean and also we are we are we are at a point where productivity is so is so productivity becomes so important so and um especially when you i mean if you, you when you guys are starting out you're starting out as a uh, as, as a town planner or um as a, an architect um the main thing that you do is basically draftsman work right so yeah. it's the ability that it gives you to do that but also um it enables you to now think about creatively how can you make this much more interesting instead of just doing a base plan with whomever said um you might like whatever concept that person that the person has asked you to do uh yeah. so how you like you are able to not only do that base work but also take it further uh, because you have more time to do that right yeah exactly so yeah yeah definitely increases the, the productivity i think it I, I mean if you know how to really use it it has the ability to do that yeah um i think it's a quite new so it's it's hard to cause you're kind of learning at the same time but then you also want to like pass it on or um, it would be nice if, if we had these kind of cl classes adverts. Um, I would relish in some <laughs> GIS teaching. In, in, this, uh, yeah. in the states, I mean, Zara, Zara Hadid's um, office. They have, they have people. Well, they, I mean, they are. They have people there where the workflow begins at the. Um, is starting out. They, I mean, they're encouraging it anyway. 
to where it, it begins with the um, like things like Mid Journey or Delhi oh. as a concept making tool. And then, then people do, but then they build on that. Yes, There's it's a sky. It's in there. Like, I think South Africa, I mean, South Africa is a bit behind, right? Yeah. But there's so much potential that um, usefulness. I mean, even in the architectural, I think one of the architectural programs is as a, I forget his name now, he practiced it at the Hadid um, office where he, that's what he teaches. He teaches you how to better, how to use better prompts in mid journey 